your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading to Psalm 147, please, the 147th Psalm. Psalm 147. We're going to read the first five verses of Psalm 147, reading them responsibly as we normally do. I'll begin together on one, and then you read two with me, and we'll alternate to read for, through verse number five. All right? As we usually do, let's stand together for the reading of the Scripture. And let's begin together on verse number one. Ready? Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now in prayer this evening. We thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music tonight and for the wonderful spirit that's here tonight in this place. Thank you for the faithfulness of the people of God to be in their place on Sunday night. And Lord, we come with a desire to hear from your word, for you to speak to us through the truths of the word of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll continue to make our hearts ready tonight, that you, we will all have ears to hear what the spirit would say to each of us this evening. What's the special, Lord, to that end, please? In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When you're up against the wall And your mountain seems so tall And you realize that life's not always fair you can run away and hide, let the old man decide, or you can change your circumstances with a prayer. When everything falls apart, praise his name. When you have a broken heart, just raise your hands and say, Lord, you're all I need. You're everything to me. Let him take the pain away. When it seems you're all alone, praise his name. When you feel you can't go on, just raise your hands and say, Greater is he that is in me you can praise the hurt away you can overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony and you'll see the darkness go as your faith begins to grow you're not alone so how can you be lonely when everything falls apart? Praise his name when you have a broken heart. Just raise your hands and say, Lord, you're all I need. You're everything to me. Let him take the pain away. When it seems you're all alone, praise his name. When you feel you can't go on, just raise your hands and say, Greater is he that is in me. He can take the word away if you'll just praise his name. Now, Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer this evening as we come to open up your word. 
I want to thank you tonight for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your words, and we desire to seek help in instruction and comfort from your word tonight. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me as I bring the message to be clear and to be understandable, that it would be a help to the people of God that are here in this place. So, Lord, minister tonight to your people as only you can do, and I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, there was a football coach years ago, I think he's, he's not alive anymore, but his name was Bum Phillips. Uh, anybody here remember that name, Bum Phillips, football coach? And he was at the Houston Oilers at that time, I think they're the Tennessee Titans now, but he made this comment. He said, there's two types of coaches in the NFL, those that have been fired and them that are going to get fired, Okay. And uh, that's the truth. Can I, can I help you with something tonight? There's two types of people in the world. Those who've been hurt and those who are going to be hurt. Okay? Uh, nobody's going to escape that. Uh, you're not going to avoid that. You're not going to get by without that. At one time or another in your life, you are going to be hurt. Uh, if it hasn't happened already, I don't want to rain on your parade, but it's going to happen. Okay? And you have to be prepared and ready for that at some time or another. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, just because you follow Jesus Christ doesn't mean you get an exemption. Okay? You're going you're gonna to suffer some hurt. I've spoken to several folks recently uh, that have gone through what I call hurts. Maybe abuse physically or emotionally. Maybe divorce their own or their parents. Could be an untimely death of a loved one. But... I was reading, it, in fact, it's interesting, uh, uh, Time Magazine just came to the house and uh, someone had given us a subscription for that and it, the, the headline was about antidepressants and there's uh, over 16 million adults now in America, they say, that suffer from depression and that does not count the growing number of teenagers and children that are suffering from depression. Uh, it's the leading cause of disability in the United States, costing the U.S. economy $210 billion a year. Antidepressant drugs bring in over $15 billion annually in sales, expected to go over $17 billion uh, very soon. Every year, about 42.5 million American adults suffer from some mental illness. Diagnosed as depressed, bipolar, schizophrenic, those are all uh, 42.5 million. That's 18% that's of the U.S. population. Why are we depressed? Why are we struggling with these things? Why all the mental illnesses? I believe uh, uh, much of it is because people don't know what to do with the hurts. They don't know what to do with the, the things that have happened in their life and they, they don't know what to do with them and uh, they do the wrong things with them and it affects them physically. You know, our world is filled with brokenness. Our world is filled with broken people. Every day you can look at people and you see walking wounded going around. Oh, folks learn to disguise it. We learn to, to hide it pretty well. But folks are wounded and they're hurting. And the issue is not if you'll deal with brokenness. The issue is how will I deal with brokenness? Because it will come. Now, there's, there's three types of brokenness. There's physical brokenness, which, is, which comes from illnesses sicknesses, disease, physical things that can break us. There's emotional brokenness. These are hurts and sorrows, uh, traumatic experiences we've gone through emotionally that stay with us. Some of you, some of you have been hurt uh, emotionally by words, and you, you'll still remember somebody, what, what somebody said to you when you were five years old or seven years old, and words that you still carry with you. Some are spiritual brokenness. Sin leaves us broken in the eyes of God. 
But it's only when we admit we're broken that God can begin to heal us and God can begin to fix us. The psalm we read in Psalm 147 and verse number 3, if you notice that when we read it tonight, notice there with me. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Now let me talk to you about brokenheartedness in, in, in how the Hebrews looked at that word broken in heart. Uh, our, our modern understanding doesn't quite go as deep as what the Hebrew understanding of that word was. Uh, literally broken in the heart. The word broken means to be torn, uh, broken in pieces, torn violently, or shattered. In other words, the implication here is it's shattered beyond repair. So many pieces, you can't put them back together again. You can't, no amount of super glue will get the job done. And, and, and nothing can be done. And so you understand the Hebrew understanding of the heart is far more than that organ that pumps blood inside of our chest. Uh, to the Hebrew, it was uh, the center of everything for a person. It was the core of their being. It's, it's who you were. It's the source of the will and, and, and the mind and the emotion. It was the place of strength and courage in a person's life. And so to be brokenhearted meant the core of your being is broken. Who you really are has been crushed. Brokenhearted means to have everything that you are torn away from you. And, and you're left with nothing. Now, there's, there, there's five ways. I'm going to give you five things not to do with your hurt. And then I want to give you five things that you should do with your hurt. Okay? So, we got ten things, about 15 minutes on each one. Hope you brought a snack. No, I'm, I'm kidding. We're not going to take that long, all right? But, uh, but I want you to listen carefully, and I think it'll help you, not only to help yourself, but I hope it'll be able to help you to help somebody else, okay? Here's what you don't do with those hurts and with that things that have broken your heart. Number one, you don't ignore it. You don't ignore it. I know, uh, you know, the, the, there's somebody who say, hey, man, just, just, you know, come on, blow it off, suck it up, get with it, forget it, right? Macho man, right? Come on, what's wrong with you? Uh, you, you just, uh, ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Okay? You can deny it, you can delay it, you can minimize it, but ignoring it never heals it. Ignoring it never heals it. Time heals all wounds. That may be true, but time also can make the infection grow worse if you don't do something about it. So, be careful about that. Denying it, delaying it, minimizing it can turn a minor problem into a major problem. And you don't want that to happen. So ignoring the hurt doesn't work. It'll only make it worse. Number two, people run from it. People run from their hurts all the time. They escape. They retreat. They get away as fast as they can. That's human nature. Human nature, we talked about this morning, when, when you feel hurt, the idea is to run away. You want to isolate. You want to get away from everybody. I don't want to see anybody. don't want to talk to anybody. Leave me alone. And they want to run away. Sometimes people run, they move. Some of you uh, had, had situations when you were younger and your family uh, several times a year, or maybe many times a year, get up and move. What are we doing? We're running away from hurts. In many cases. The psalmist said in Psalm 55, he said this, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. You know what he's trying to do? Run away from his hurt. He said, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. Selah. Selah means think about it. Pause and think about that for a while. And that's what the psalmist was wanting to do. And when people hurt, they run. Oh, they may, run to, they may run to drugs. They may run to alcohol. They may run to pleasure. They may run to spending money, gambling. They may run to immorality. They may run to food. But people run. And they run to something else to do what? Try and get away from their hurt. Okay? So ignoring it's the wrong thing. Running from it's the wrong thing. And then number three, hiding it is the wrong thing. 
Boy, people, we get good at that, don't we? People hide it. They wear a mask. We're not going to tell anybody we hurt. No one's going to know I hurt. We camouflage our pain. Someone asks, everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. And we want them to just leave us alone. We, we feel like if we admit we're hurt, we are opening ourselves up to more hurt. And we don't want to do that, so we just hide it. Revealing your feelings and revealing the hurt is the beginning of healing. Sometimes people, sometimes people hide it by medicating it. All you're doing is hiding it. All you're doing is masking it. And you're not going to ever get healing from it. You're again, you're hiding from the pain and the hurt. You know, James says something interesting. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. It's interesting. Now, I, I'm not, I don't think this is talking about, and it doesn't say confess your sins one to another. There's only one you confess your sin to, and that's God. Okay? Uh, this is not teaching confession. Okay? Uh, but it said confess your faults one to another. Again, it's amazing, isn't it, uh, how, how, how hesitant we are to tell anybody about a fault we have when we know we all have them. And yet we're surprised when somebody says they have one. Why is that? And so the Bible says we ought to have a, a, enough of a confidence, and this isn't confessing your sin to everybody, confessing your fault to everyone or your, 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 your hurt, but it's confessing to someone who you trust and someone who you have confidence in. Let them in. Let them in. Why? They'll pray for you that ye may be healed. Okay? Uh, as long as you won't confess it, you won't give it, you still hide from it and you keep it hidden from others, uh, you can't get healing. You need to be able to confess that and you'll begin to heal. So don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Don't hide it. Number four, don't worry over it. Some people just worry over it. They, they, they hover over their hurt like a mother hen hovers over her chicks. Worry is an attempt to control the uncontrollable. Let me understand, there are things in your life you can't control. There are things in your life you can't change. Only God can. That's only on, in His control. And so worry is worry just plays the pain over and over again in your mind and in your life. God, in the book of Colossians, He told the church at Colossae, He said, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. He's saying, he says, you, you set your mind on heavenly things, for you died. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And so, if Christ is really in charge, if I'm, listen, it's very tough to be dead and in charge. Make sense? Huh? That's deep, I know. See if you can grasp it. All right? Yeah, I, so who's in charge? Christ is in charge. Why am I worrying about that? Don't worry about when Christ is in charge. Worry never solves any problems. It never heals any hurt. In fact, the more you worry about it, the bigger it seems. So don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Don't hide it. Don't worry about it because, number five, you'll become bitter about it. You'll become bitter about it. And bitterness never makes you better. Oftentimes, when people get hurt, they become bitter. They get angry, and then they clothe themselves in self-pity. You want people to feel sorry for you. And you get bitter, and you know, the Bible talks about in Hebrews, a root of bitterness springs up, and thereby many are defiled. And you just get a sour attitude about everybody. You know, uh, oftentimes you see people as they grow older get bitter. And they're not pleasant to be around. Anybody know any old grouches? Hope you're not married to one. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, who was I talking to? Uh, Dan and Karen. Uh, they went recently to see her parents, I believe. They're in their mid-80s. 
And she just said, what, what delightful people they were. They're just positive and happy. And, and it was just a, it's just great to be around them. And I said, you know what, I, I, hope, when, I hope when I get to be that age, 35 years from now, <laughs> you don't believe me. Huh? But you know what, that's how I want to be. I, I, don't, I don't want to be bitter. I, wanna, I don't want to see things in a negative light all the time. I don't always want to see the, the cup half empty instead of half full. I don't always see, yeah, but what if this is going to happen? What if that's going to happen? You know, it, 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 really comes <clears throat> it really comes to light, you know, when, when you're, it really comes to light when you're a grandparent. You know, you know, there's things that I worry about with those two little kids at our house that, that mom never even blinks an eye at. Uh, any of you experience that? You're like some kids on the edge of this. I'm like, oh, fuck. you know, she's going by the business. Oh, well, you know, he, I think, wow. But I probably was that way when I was that age. Never thought about. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to always think what can go wrong. Sometimes as we get older, that's what we think too. Now, what if this and what if that? And, and we worry about things. So don't, and, and if you're not careful, you get bitter. Bitterness is a self-destructive behavior. Bitterness, are you listening, is a poison that will kill you. It won't affect the person you're bitter at. It'll kill you. So don't get bitter. Anger and bitterness never heal hurt. So you say, all right, Pastor, what does heal my hurt? I'm glad you asked me that question. Let me give you five simple things tonight that you need to remember to get healing from your hurt. Number one, remember who is in charge. <coughs> remember who is in charge. Charles Spurgeon said this, Depression forces me to go back to the promises of God's faithfulness. And here's what I found. God was preparing me for something greater. The cloud is black before it breaks. It overshadows before it releases its deluge of mercy. Depression has now become to me as a prophet in rough clothing. I like that. He's saying God's in charge. The world may be falling apart, but it's not without His permission. It's not without God knowing what's going on. God is on the throne. And He never left it. And He doesn't leave it. He knows what's going on. And you belong to Him. And He never loses anyone. Okay? Uh, you are His, and you have the treasure of eternal life. And so... God is in charge. And, it, and when you remember that God is in charge, it helps you to remember what the truth is. Because your emotions tell you things that are not true. Sometimes the biggest thing you hear with people who have been hurt is say, you don't know how I feel. Well, I just feel this way. And, and, and I'm certainly not discounting the emotions. Emotions are informers. But we have to make sure that the information or the informers are legitimate. Whenever you have, you know, if you're a newspaper person, or you're, well, I can't hardly use that anymore, can I? Because I was going to say, you want to make sure your sources are legitimate, but I'm not sure they do that anymore either. But, but that's the way it used to be. You want to make sure that who you're getting the information from is reliable and accurate in what they're saying. Well, you want to make sure that way about your emotions. Because the informant has to be reliable. The, 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 the emotions come from our heart. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the emotions, they lie to you. That's why don't, don't listen when somebody says, follow your heart. Don't do that. Follow God. Follow His Word, not your heart. Now, how do I know then? How can I make sure if I'm, these emotions are coming from my heart, which means they're from the core of my being? It's really how I feel. I understand that. So I'm not saying just dismiss the emotions. I'm saying check them out. And how do I check them out? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Look there with me, will you? Hebrews chapter 4. Turn your Bibles over there. 
Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. Are you doing all right? Okay. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Notice what the Bible says here. Are you there? Say amen. Okay. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's the thoughts, the discerner there means that which distinguishes or that which causes to understand. So what is it that causes me to understand my emotions that are coming from my heart? It's the Word of God. The Bible helps me understand what these emotions, whether they're true or whether they're false, whether they're reliable or unreliable. And so only the Bible can do that. You have to trust the truth. You have to trust who's in charge. Who's in charge? God or my emotions? God. No matter what my emotions say. See? I have to bring, I, have to, I know whether my emotions are reliable or not because the Word of God will show me whether they are or not. And so you submit them to the Word of God. Listen, any airline pilot will tell you he has to refuse to trust his own instincts and his own senses when he's flying in a storm. What does the pilot have to trust? The instrument panel. He has to trust what he's saying. You've heard, I think, I think the most famous one was several years ago was uh, uh, the Kennedy, uh, the young Kennedy fellow. He was flying his plane and he, they say he got, he got, you know, where, well, you get turned upside down. You don't think up is down, down is up. You're, you don't know what, what, what you're looking at because you have to trust the instrument panel. There's times when your emotions, you're not going to go whether you're, you don't know whether you're up or down. You don't know whether what's right is right or wrong is wrong or upside down. You need to trust the instrument panel. And don't rely on your instincts. Rely on the Word of God. So realize who is in control. If that pilot can get so confused that he loses his sense of up and down, we sure can get confused and lose our sense of what's right and wrong as well. And our emotions can do that. So number one, remember who's in charge. Number two, number two, don't blame God for your dysfunctional family. Don't blame God for your dysfunctional family. How many understand you can choose your friends, but you're born with your family? You didn't pick the family you were born into. Now for this, I want you to go back to the book of Genesis. Would you go there, please? I want you to go to Genesis. Um, chapter 39. Let's talk about Joseph. You know, there's a lot of people, listen to me, there's a lot of people that, that blame their issues in life on their family. For whatever reason, for whatever dysfunction they want to apply to it, that's why I am the way I am. And, and they, they, they put the blame on family. And by the way, they'll go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and they'll feed that. Say, yeah, you're that way because, you know, your dad didn't spend time with you or your mama did this to you or you're, you know, you grew up being a Cincinnati Reds fan or whatever it may be, you know. Uh, they'll, they'll, oh, Left preaching, got the medal in there, didn't I, Brother J.B.? Amen. We love to blame our situation on our family, but I want you to think about Chase. I want to think about Joseph's family, will you? Let's talk about Joseph's father. What was his name? Jacob. Jacob, the supplanter. Jacob, the trickster. Jacob, the guy who cheated his brother. Joseph's uncle, out of the birthright and out of the blessing. Jacob was such a schemer and a deceiver. He 
He ended up with two wives, you remember? And two concubines, and, and they were competing for his interest and his love. Having, uh, you know, one uh, that couldn't have children, and she got the concubines to have children with her and name these kids, and, and each name was hoping that now he'll love me and now he'll, I'll have his affection. Battle going on. Then, out of the 12 sons, listen, Jacob had a favorite. And who was his favorite? Joseph. And he didn't make it a secret. He, he got a beautiful coat of many colors and gave it to Joseph. And what did the brothers get? Nada. Zilch. Nothing. Hmm? I mean, they knew he was the favorite. And that just, hey, what about, his, what about Joseph's brothers? So, well, they had a little sibling rivalry there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. They hated him. They, they came that close to killing him. I mean, if anybody could have an excuse why they don't turn out too good, it sure could have been Joseph. Well, what do you do if you don't have the perfect family? And by the way, can I help you? The perfect family doesn't exist. Okay? Don't get in your mind some perfect, you, you know, uh, Ozzie and Harriet was a TV show. Okay? It's not real. But it's interesting. Joseph never blamed anything on his family. It's an amazing story. Wronged by his brothers, he still loved them. Maintain, wanted to have a relationship with them. Wanted them to come and see him. Never blamed his family for what happened to him. Reuben, one of Joseph's brothers, slept with his father's wife. Simeon and Levi get mad and end up killing some people. And some animals. I mean, Joseph is in a family where his brothers express their anger in some real visible ways. In some real immoral ways. Yet Joseph still maintained ties with these guys. And loved them. You can't blame wrong behavior on your family. You cannot blame wrong behavior on your family. You are responsible for how you respond to your family situations. You have to be faithful to God despite the emotional baggage that sometimes comes with families. You know, I, I was reminded, and we're going to stay with Joseph here. We're going to come to him in the next few points as well. But I want you to think about in Judges, I believe it's Judges chapter 11. There's a man named Jephthah. The Bible says Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. But his mother was a harlot. Put that together. When, I mean, what happened was, dad went out and had a fling and a prostitute or somebody. The Bible says it was a harlot. And a son was a result of that. And dad brought him home to be with the rest of the family. Huh, how'd that work? It didn't. He got old enough, you know what the rest of the family did? They kicked him out. And we don't want you in the family. But wait a minute. Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. Integrity, courage. And when they needed someone to deliver them, you know what they did? They went and got Jephthah. If you talk about someone who could have used an excuse, I was, you know, he could have said, I'm what they call the illegitimate child. I was rejected and my family didn't want me. They kicked me out. And he could have used that as an excuse not to amount to anything. He could have used an excuse to get on all kinds of medication. 
but he didn't do it. Because he wasn't going to blame God for his dysfunctional family. Remember who's in charge. Don't blame God for your dysfunctional family. Number three, remember this. Even in time of trouble, God is with us. Joseph, hated by his brothers, ganged up on, thrown in a well, or thrown in a pit, and sold to slave traders, taken to Egypt, sold to Pharaoh, or the Potiphar, who's uh, high up in the Pharaoh's personal guard. Let me ask you a question. You think Joseph had a right to be angry? Be careful. Was he treated wrongly? Yeah. Does that justify him acting wrongly? No. He wouldn't allow the bitterness or the anger to capture his soul. He continued to have the right perspective of God. He remembered who was in control. Chapter 39. Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Here's an important, don't miss this phrase. First phrase of verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Even in the worst of circumstances, who was there? God. God. Hey, where is God when it hurt? God was there. God is there. He's always there. Even when you experience some bad situations. Even if they were your own fault. God is still there. He's there for us to turn to. He's there for us to rely upon. Joseph never forgot that. God was with him. You're going to see that unfold here as we look at Joseph. When you go through hard times, when you go through painful times, would you remember that God is there? That seems so simple, doesn't it? But oftentimes, it's the last person we reach out to. It seems to be the last person we turn to. It seems to be the one who we don't want to go to or seek his help. Do we seek his help? Do we ask for his help? Or do we only blame God and say, why did you let this happen? You know, we often blame God for things that make us stronger. We often blame God for things that make us stronger. God, God does not often give us what we like. But He does give us what's good for us. You know, most of you, if... How many of you have been out of school? Uh, think back to high school, okay? Some of you, that's almost impossible, I know. <laughs> Brother Bob, think of that one-room schoolhouse, okay? You, uh, but you, you think about teachers you had. Most everybody, most everybody had the fun teacher. You could do stuff in their class and talk and... And then you had that teacher that was hard. No nonsense. H strict. Thank you. You remember high school? Man, that's good. Did they have high school? Never mind. Oh, Jeanette. Um, you, you know what's interesting? Once you're through and you look back, you know who you appreciate? The tough one. The one who made you learn. The one who didn't just tell you everything was on the test so you could memorize it and spit it out and then never learned anything. The one who made you think. The one who made you work. I talked with Brother Barnes who runs the discipleship home in Rockford. 
And he said, you know, he said there were guys here that when they were in the home, he said, and you, if you asked me about them, I'd have told you they hate my guts. They hate me. He said, and those same guys, he said, some of those same guys, he said, are ones who call me and email me now and say, we sure appreciate you. We, we we're so thankful for what we learned while we're there. Thank you for influencing our life. We pray for you every day. Those are the ones who show their love and appreciation. But during the time they're going through there, they thought he was the worst guy on earth. You know? God doesn't always do what you like. God does do what he knows is good for us. Is good for us. Don't we do that with our children? Do you give your children everything they want? If your child says, I don't like that, hmm? our kids are not allowed to say that word. If it was dinner time and something's on the table and they said, I don't like that, they got an extra spoonful of that. (laughs) Say, boy, you were mean parents. Yes, we were. Absolutely. But you know, God will use those times of difficulty to develop our character. Joseph had to be a man of character. He wasn't, he wasn't going to come by it genetically. That wasn't in the genes. If he got his daddy's genes, he's going to trick and deceive and, 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 and scheme a way to get what he wants. But God wants to develop character in him. And so he has to wait patiently and strengthen his confidence in God. A period where he's waiting. He got into Egypt and not long after he got into working for Potiphar, he got promoted. And he got promoted to be over everything Potiphar had. Nothing went on in all of Potiphar's house, but Joseph was the doer of it. They all cleared it through him. And one day Potiphar's wife comes after Joseph. And it wasn't just a one day thing. Look at uh, chapter 39. And look at verse number 10. It came to pass as she spake to Joseph, next three words, church, day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. Day after day after day, she was there trying to find a way to get him to be immoral. Joseph had the character to, to say no. He eventually fled. And when he flees, she grabs his coat and keeps it, and then she screams and tells everybody he tried to force himself on her. Now, are they going to believe Potiphar's wife, captain of the guard? Or are they going to believe this slave that just got bought, that the Ishmaelites brought in? Well, certainly they're going to believe her. He's thrown into prison. But God was using that to develop Joseph. He was preparing Joseph for what he would do with him later. The things that God, some of you went through some things, and listen, it is as bad as prison. You feel like it was a prison, but God was using that to develop you for the work He has for you to do, to be the person that He wants you to be. That later Joseph would get out of prison and stand before Pharaoh. And he developed wisdom and he developed character that he otherwise may have never had had he not been through that experience. God perfectly suited him and prepared him to lead the nation of Egypt through the difficult days of famine that would come. Pharaoh recognizes out of all the people in the whole land of Egypt who's the best guy to lead us through this? Joseph. I'm sure that didn't set real well with all the Egyptians. Who's this outsider coming in and running things? But he elevates Joseph to second in command of the whole nation. Joseph didn't know what was ahead, but God knew what was ahead. God knew what was coming. God was with him. In fact, 
when he gets put in prison. Chapter 39. Again, verse 20. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. Uh Ah, ah. Remember, he was in Potiphar's house, sold as a slave, but the Lord was with him. Now he's in prison, but verse 21, what's the first phrase? But the Lord was with Joseph. He was with him even in prison. The keeper of the prison, verse 23, looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. God was with him. God's always with you. He's always with you. Don't ever forget that. Number four, seek God's purpose in your suffering and hurt. What is God's purpose? It is not necessary to ever ask God why. Who is God? God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let me ask you a question. Can God do whatever he wants to do? Yes or no? Does he need my permission? Does he need your permission? No. Why do I question? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Does the creature say to the creator, why are you doing this to me? Does the, does the vessel on the potter's wheel say to the potter, what are you doing to me? Hmm? You see, God, God can accomplish great things through suffering. That, that is hard for American Christians to grasp. It's, it's probably, I don't know, 75 degrees in here. We're suffering. No, we're not. No, we're not. That's how, you know, we were, it's interesting, you baseball people, I was watching the game last night, and the, the first place Cleveland Indians game, and, um, Thought I'd throw that in. It's interesting. They were they were playing in the same uniforms from the um, uh, nineteen seventeen White Sox and Indians. Both those franchises are over hundred years old, and they were getting up, putting up statistics from nineteen seventeen, where the one pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, brother Jason, was had 23 wins that year. And I, yeah, that was fourth best in the American League. He had 320 innings pitched. Nowadays, nowadays, and by the way, that was fourth best in the league. Nowadays, if a pitcher gets 200 innings, he's a, he's a workhorse. This guy threw 320, and he was only fourth best in the league. My son said, wow, what has happened to us? I was talking to my son during the game. I said, yeah, we've, we, we've become wimpy. A pitcher down baseball, oh, he gets to 100 pitches, we've got to shut him down. Hmm? Bob Feller and some of those old timers, they laugh at that stuff. Anyway, most of that doesn't mean anything to most of you. But What, am I, uh, what, I'm, what I want to say is we get, we've gotten so soft. We've gotten so, so uh, sissified. That, that if we suffer a little bit or we, we have something a little hard, we, we don't want anything to do with it. But personal suffering has several benefits. Listen, it could help us to understand the sufferings of others. It could help us, it, it will produce Christian maturity. Suffering, by the way, suffering can bring someone to Christ. Some of you would have never got saved if you hadn't been in a hard spot. Sometimes God puts people in a place where they have nowhere to look but up. And if he doesn't do that, they'll never look up. And some of you wouldn't be saved if God hadn't pulled the rug out from under you in your life. But suffering also can bring us into a closeness with Christ that we'd never know if we didn't suffer. 
Paul said, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. That's why Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And he was glad to do so. Why? The fellowship of his sufferings. There's, a, there's an immediate there's immediate connection with people who've gone through similar suffering. Those of you in the room tonight that have, that have lost a spouse, there's, there, there's people who can come up and say, boy, I understand, but you know what? If they haven't lost their spouse, they don't understand. They can try to understand. But boy, when someone else comes up alongside of you, who just lost their husband or just lost their wife not long ago, there's an immediate connection. Because you know what? You know they've been through, they're going through, or they've been through what you're going through. When you lose a child, somebody can try to understand and say, oh, I, I, I understand what you're going through, but if you've never lost a child, you don't know what they're going through. But if one has had a miscarriage or one has lost a child and another woman comes up and says, you know, I went through that and it tells their story, there's an immediate connection between those two women. Happens all the time. Suffering accomplishes something in our life. <clears throat> God has a purpose in everything He does. God has a purpose in all things. Hey, do all things work together for good or not? Is that promise true or not? Look at Genesis 45. Move ahead with me, will you? Genesis 45. I want you to see something. Joseph saw God's hand in the circumstances of his life. Now, hey, remember when they found Joseph and he, he had on that coat and they said, well, we're away from home. Dad will never know. They, they took him. They, were gonna, they threw him in a pit. They were going to wait for the wild animals to come and get him. And then they ended up selling him into slavery. And, and they took his coat. And remember, they tore it up and they put it in blood, blood of an animal, try to convince dad he was murdered, right? And then the Ishmaelites came and they sold him. Who sold Joseph into slavery? His brothers. Let's see what Joseph said. Joseph, verse 4, Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. These two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Verse 8, are you watching? So now it was not you that sent me hither, but who sent Joseph into Egypt? God did. Who had Joseph sold into slavery and sent down to Egypt? God did. God did. And Joseph saw that. What's God doing in your life? What's God doing in your life? Well, you may not like it. And we may wish it was something different. Maybe we want pleasure instead of the pain and But if you'll accept it, embrace it as the will of God. And see that God's at work. That's what God's after. All of us desire approval from others, but the most important approval is God's approval. All of us need companionship to overcome emotional hurts, but the most important companion is Jesus Christ. Why don't you look in Genesis chapter 50. In Genesis 50, you have the great verse number 20, which is the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament, where Joseph tells his brothers, As for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. You, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. But before he could say that, verse 19 comes before verse 20. And before he could say that, he said this, Fear not, 
For am I in the place of God? You see, he had to realize, I'm not in God's place. If, if I decide what's good or evil, I decide this was all bad, I'm in the place of God. I'm not in the place of God. I'm not in, hey, Joseph says, I'm not in control of any of this. God is. And when I try to take control and I try to make it work out my way, I'm in the place of God. I have to, let, I have to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. And my own understanding, man, I, I know God, I think I'll do it this way. <laughs> Seek God's purpose in your suffering and your hurt. God, what are you preparing me for? What is your purpose for me having gone through this or going through this now? What do you want to teach me? What am I to learn from this? And let me give you number five and we'll be done. Number five is pretty simple. Let Jesus heal you. We said about healing the brokenhearted in Psalm 147, verse 3. In the 23rd Psalm, it talks about the shepherd, thou anointest my head with oil. The shepherd would put oil on the head of the sheep for two, two reasons, to soothe and to heal. You put it on the, 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 the soothing because the flies would irritate the sheep, and I'm not going to deal with that right now. The other way oil was used was as an ointment for healing. When the sheep would have an open wound, the shepherd would put oil in it to expedite the healing process and help ease the pain. And God said he'll heal the broken in heart and he'll bind up our wounds. He'll bind them up. He'll put that healing ointment on them. And God, that's what the Bible says. When he says, is there not a balm in Gilead? Not a bomb, B-O-M-B, a balm, B-A-L-M. And, and it's, a, it's a soothing, it's a, he, he soothes those hurts. That's what the shepherd does to us. And he'll heal us. And sometimes he heals us by sending people into our life that will help that healing. And that will encourage us and will help us. That's called fellowship. Sometimes he heals us by making his presence known in a real way that we'd never known if we weren't hurt. If we hadn't gone through that time of suffering. Sometimes that healing takes place quickly. Sometimes it takes a period of time to heal. But he heals the broken hearted. That is a promise. Take it to the bank. Now, let me say this. Oftentimes, even when you're healed, you'll have scars. There are scars after you've been hurt. Now, you have a choice when you look at the scars. You can look at the scars and you can remember the hurt, or you can look at the scars and you can remember the healing. That's your decision. That's your choice. You either focus on the hurt or you focus on the healer. <clears throat> the problem so often in, in recovery programs or in psychologists, psychiatrists, all they focus on is the hurt. They don't focus on the healer. They don't focus on the healing. That's why Reformers Unanimous, when the, the addictions, we focus on Jesus Christ. Why? He's the answer. That's why. You don't focus on the problem. You focus on the solution. You don't focus on the hurt. You focus on the healer. It reminds you that God cares for us and brings comfort. Let me close with this illustration for you. There's a young man that attended school in a large northeastern city. In his studies, he fell in love with eagles. He read everything he could about eagles. He watched documentaries. <clears throat> he studied. And the more he studied, the more he watched, the more he fell in love with eagles. And he promised himself that when he graduated college, he'd travel out west and observe the eagles in nature. He found a job teaching and he saved his money all year and summer came and he booked a flight out west to where eagles could be found. He rented a jeep, took his camping gear, and away he went to his search of eagle watching. 
He talked to some of the locals and found a good area and set up his campsite, took his binoculars and telescope and set them up. The next day, he watched all day but never saw any eagles. He traveled deeper into the cliff areas and he observed up the mountains. Finally, on the second evening, he spotted a beautiful eagle soaring high in the sky. He watched and followed that eagle to where she landed on the nest. Before sun came up the next morning, the man had moved where he could watch the eagles. And his experience was much greater than he ever could imagine. Several days he watched the nest and the flight patterns of the eagle. He focused on the nest and saw the baby eaglets in their nest. And one morning he was watching the male eagle soaring in the sky. And to his amazement, the eagle went into a dive with great speed, dipped beneath the tree line, and he didn't see him for a few moments. And then all of a sudden, he came soaring back up into the sky. But as he watched, only momentarily that eagle was flying when all of a sudden the eagle started free-falling from the sky. The eagle seemed limp, and it was dropping from the sky at a high rate of speed. The young man started hiking to the area where the eagle had fallen to its death. And when he got there, he found the eagle dead, and attached to its chest was a dead weasel. It seemed the eagle had swooped to the ground, captured the weasel with his sharp talons, and as the eagle started flying upward, the weasel dug into the eagle's chest and it dug into the eagle's heart. As the eagle was clinging to the weasel, he refused to let go. Had he just let the weasel go, it would have dropped to its death and he could have went down and got the food but he refused to let go. And hanging on to the weasel meant sure death for the eagle. The young teacher stood over that lifeless body and he said, Eagle, all you had to do was to let go. All you had to do to live was to let go. Some of you tonight, in order to live, you just got to let go. Let it go. Let go of the trauma. Let go of the hurt. Remember God is in control. That whatever happened, they may have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And God will use it for good in your life. Hanging on will only bring you down. Clinging to the bitterness and anger and the hurt, it will destroy you. Let go and trust God. That's what you do with the hurts of life. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord. I, I think of so many people in the Bible who went through hurt. It's hard to, hard to think of ones who, knit, who didn't go through some hurt. Paul had people forsake him. Alexander the coppersmith did him much wrong. Moses had murder and Moses brought up in Egypt. Naomi lost her husband and her two boys. David with his dysfunctional family. So many, God. But they learned what to do with their hurts. And I pray, Lord, you'd help folks tonight to take these truths and to meditate upon them. There'll be many that tonight will get the weasel off their chest that's been sucking the life out of them. And they'll be free to soar to the sky again. And do whatever it is you'd have them to do. That they could rise as Joseph did. Be what you desired him to be and what you molded and shaped him to be. Even through the hurts, even through the trials, even through the heart. Speak to hearts tonight, God, and I pray that many people will let it go this evening. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, there's either hurts I'm going through now or there's a hurt from my past. It's been difficult for me. 
tonight, the Spirit of God helped me. And I know now what I need to do with the hurt. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look over these things, and I'm going to, by the grace of God, do these things. And Pastor, by the grace of God, I'm going to get that weasel off my chest tonight. I'm not going to live in my hurt anymore. God is in control of my life. God is working in my life. God is always there. I will trust Him that He knows what's best for me. Pastor, God has spoken to my heart tonight. Please pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up tonight, Christian? Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Many hands. God bless you. You may put them down. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Pastor, I know some people that are hurting. And by his grace, with his help, I'm going to share these things, what to do when you're hurt. I'm going to share these with somebody to try to help them get through their hurt. Pastor, pray for me as I go to share this with others, with someone who I know could use it. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? Yes. Yes. Everybody knows somebody, don't they? Amen. You may put them down. I'll pray for you. You pray for them tonight. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. You need to come and pray. Get the weasel off your chest. You do so. You need to come and pray for another who you're going to share this with. Come pray for them tonight. Let's ask God to do a work in our hearts. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. And Lord, thank you for the help from your word. Lord, thank you that you're a God who cares about our hurts. Thank you that you're always there. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. That you're in control of our lives. Lord, we love you this evening. Pray you'll hear our prayers. We kneel around this altars tonight. And may some, may many, find their flight to freedom this evening of giving their hurt to you. Help each one to do now what you're bidding them to do in their heart. And Lord, may the blessing of this go far beyond this room tonight. And we'll thank you for it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? Oh, to Jesus I right. surrender. Oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the surrender Lord I give myself to thee fill me with thy love and power let thy blessing fall on me 
I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Look this way for a minute. You know, I was thinking about it kind of, it's amazing how it kind of fits in with the morning message as well. You know, going through suffering is an opportunity for folks to see Christ in us. I, I thought about Saul when it, Jesus said on the road to Damascus, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I, I, I really believe that's the pricking of his conscience. And I think it goes back to where Stephen was stoned and they laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And he watched Stephen get stoned to death. And, and they watched as his face, the Bible says, looked like the face of an angel. And he basically said what the Lord Jesus said on the cross, pretty much. Lay not this sin to their charge. He said, don't, don't forgive them. He, he never got over that. How can a guy when they're throwing you with rocks, stones. You know, I would think most people would be angry and lash out as much as they could. I don't know if it was me, I'd want to pick one up and throw it back. And he didn't do that. And that never, that left uh, an imprint on Saul that he never got away from. You know, when, when you allow others to see Christ in you through the suffering, through the hurt it makes an impression on them that they very very have a very difficult time getting away from may jesus be seen in us may we know what we do with our hurts amen let's pray together father thank you for a wonderful day today thank you for our church family thank you lord for being a god who loves us and cares for us and is actively at work in each of our lives and father i pray that you'll continue to make us mindful always and as we run this race, help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And may you work in us and through us this week that which is well-pleasing in your sight. Lord, let us be a blessing and let us be an encouragement. Let us be a help to every person we come in contact with this week. May others see Jesus in us. Thank you, Lord, for a good day in the house of the Lord. Dismiss us now with your care and make us mindful that you go with us from this place. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it, all right? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Hey, it's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.